through the uh, uh, speakers because the uh, vid grid system has been failing on the audio and I want to make absolutely sure that it's not the microphone so that when I ask them to troubleshoot it yet again, if it screws up, uh, that it, it definitely is not the microphone. If you hear it go out, go ahead and yell something at me and I'll see, check the batteries or something, but uh, I wanted to make sure that it's not the microphone uh, because it has been cutting out on the last two videos, unfortunately. Uh, so we're t uh, this week we're continuing uh, on what we were do what we were doing last week with uh, functions, uh, but we're looking at them from a different angle. We're looking at them from uh, er an error handling perspective. Uh, so before we get into the actual material for error handling, I wanted to look at one more example of using pass by reference, that is, using pointers as uh, as parameter values. Uh, because it will give us a nice segue into the next topic of error handling. So uh, t consider the following program here. I've just got two basic functions uh, that take three inputs here, A, B, and C, all doubles, and it returns a double. One of them is called quadratic root 0, 1. The other one is called quadratic root 0, 2. Uh, I'm reading those in as command line arguments, uh, and then I'm calling each one of those functions and I'm printing it out. So let's just go ahead and compile this really quickly. W all quadratic roots. There we go. Right. Uh, oops, what's wrong? Oh, I already declared them. Sorry, they're up there. I can't declare them down here. There we go. All right, T C C. All right, great. It works. All right, it compiles at least. So the idea here is that I'm going to be comp using the quadratic formula to compute the roots of a quadratic equation. Right? A squared or uh, A x squared plus bx plus c equals 0, right? And what do you use? You use the quadratic formula, negative b plus minus a square root of b squared minus 4ac over all over 2a. You have that memorized by now, probably. Uh, but there are, there are two roots to that, right? That, uh, that negative b plus minus, uh, we, want that, uh, we want the root corresponding to that plus. We want the root corresponding to that minus. So let me go ahead and just try it out here. Does anybody have any good values that we would be able to test? No? All right, I'll just choose some values here. Uh, let's go with uh, uh, 1, 10, and 1. So if you plugged A, B, and C, 1, 10, and 1 into your quadratic equation, you would get something that looked kind of like this. Uh, there's a, there are two, both negative roots. Uh, one of them is about 1 tenth, and the other one is just shy of ten, negative 10. Right? Another value, 2, right? gives you slightly different values. Right? So. We've got a nice working program here. Uh, and again, it's just going to be negative b pl plus minus square root of b squared minus 4ac all over 2a. Right? Uh, that's pretty straightforward there. Uh, so it's a nice little program that calculates uh, quadratic roots for you rather than you having to plug in chug uh, on uh, using your TI-82 or whatever. Right? Uh, what's the problem? It, it, it seems icky, though. Uh, I'm, I'm trying to compute two values, root 1 and root 2. But to do that, I have to use two different functions that basically do almost the sa same thing. Two different names, because C does not support function overloading. Uh, overloading remember? Uh, you can't have two functions with the same name on different types, which is why we have abs, fabs, labs, etc. Uh, so for this e example, I had to do uh, you know, quadratic root 0, 1, the first one, quadratic root 0, 2, the second one. And I have no idea whether or not the first one is a plus, the second one is a minus. I, that, that's not written into the function. Uh, so it seems kind of icky that I have to have two functions to do this. Uh, and it's, but it's necessary, right? How many values can a function return? At, at most, one, right? You can have a void function that returns nothing. But a function in mathematics, if it maps to two values, it fails that, what's that test called? That vertical line test, right? You can't have that vertical, uh, vertical line test. You can't re return more than one value. Likewise, in programming, no function can return more than one value. Right? There are some programming languages that break this convention uh, to their detriment, in my opinion. Uh, but there are some languages that do that. C is not one of those languages. So what I want to do is I want to rewrite this program. Uh, knowing now what we know about passing by reference, I want to write one function to return, and I'm putting that in double quotes here, it's not actually returning two values. Instead, we're going to give it two values by reference, two buckets, 
And I'm going to put the first root into the first bucket and the second root into the second bucket. And by doing that, I have one function to compute two values at the same time. I'm going to go ahead and call this function compute roots. Right? Uh, it's also going to take a, b, and c, because of course those are necessary for the quadratic formula. right? Uh, but it's also going to take two values that are by being passed by reference. These three are all normal, regular, old, double variables. If I want to pass a variable by, va uh, by reference, though, how would I pass that? Is that right? What do I need to do and put, it, put in front of it? Star, right? That passes the memory address, the pointer, uh, a pointer to a value stored in memory. Likewise, the second one, oops, double root, uh, star root 2. So it actually takes five values. Three of them are the inputs. And then these two over here, even though I'm treating them as inputs, I'm going to be, by convention, they're passed by reference, so I'm treating them as output values as well. By passing in two of them, I can, re in effect, return two values. So now that I'm no, I'm no longer using my return value, so this can be a void function for now. We'll come back to that. All right, let's go ahead and actually implement this. So there are the two original ones. Down below here, let's go ahead and implement this. Here's the value for the first one. I need to put that into the first bucket. Is this correct? I've got my root one value up here. Do I set root one equal to this value? So what's that thing on the right hand side? It's just a value, right? Negative 0.1, negative uh, 9.8, whatever we did with our test values. Uh, what, that, what is that thing on the left-hand side, though? It's a reference. It's a memory address. It's a pointer. It's not a regular old va uh, variable that I can do this to. So what do I need to do to take that pointer and make it into a regular old var uh, variable? Star. That's called the dereferencing operator. Right? I take a, a, a pointer, put a star in front of it, it makes it into a regular variable. If I've got a regular variable, what do I put in front of it to make it into a pointer? The ampersand, good. Right. Root 2, likewise, will be the same thing, but this equation here instead. Right. And then I can return. Right. It's a void function now, so I'm not returning anything. I just have this value and this value. These are buckets that I'm filling so that uh, they're shared buckets. Right. You hand me, instead of values, you're handing me buckets so that I can fill them and then hand them back to you. Right. All right. Oh, I guess we actually need to use it, right? So instead of calling these two, I'll go ahead and comment these out. Now we need to use this in my function. So it's going to be, uh, oops, that's all right, uh, compute roots, I think it was, right? And it pass it A, oops, A, B, and C. I need to pass, oops, there we go. I need to pass this va uh, variable and this variable to that function. Is this the way I pass that to the function. Root 1 and root 2 are what kind of variables? Plain old, regular old variables. right? Compute roots, is it expecting two plain old, regular variables over here for root 1 and root 2? No. So again, how do I take plain old, regular variables, root 1 and root 2, and make them into pointers? The ampersand. And by making those small, slight changes, DCC, I am able to take, uh, it's, I didn't change the functionality, by the way, so we should be getting the same values here. And, in fact, we are. Right? I, ch I didn't change the functionality, I changed the design. Rather than have two different functions with mysterious names, root 1, root 2, what's that? I can compute both roots at the same time using one function. But the only way that I was able to compute and return, again, in effect, return uh, multiple values is by having pass by reference var variables. Right? Nice and a little bit, a little, uh, yet another uh, benefit of pass by reference. And as we'll see, this gives us a whole new world of error handling. Right? Before I go back to the notes, though, give me some other values. One, two, one. one, two, one. Why'd you give me that? What's going to happen, do you think? It's going to crash and burn. Oh, no, it's not. Right? What if I go? 2, 1, 2, though. What's going to happen here? b squared minus 4ac. What's that going to be? 1, because b is 1. 
minus 4a, which is 8, c, 2, so 16, 1 minus 16, that sounds negative to me. Can you take the square root of a negative value? Right. Square root of a negative value is complex, right? It's imaginary. And as far as my program is concerned, it gives me nan. What was nan again? Not a number, right? It's not a number as far as my program is concerned. Should you be seeing this as an end user? Right? It, 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 when you go to a web page and it fails for some reason, and you get this mysterious, just, just a bunch of code saying that it failed and it, here's a stack trace and whatever else, is that a good user experience? Should a u end user be seeing techno babble that's telling you some, uh, about some uh, error? Probably not. Likewise, NAN, I don't know what NAN is. Right? Uh, why, is it, why is it giving me NAN? What number is NAN? Right? I don't understand imaginary numbers because I haven't taken that course yet. Right? Uh, what are some other values that could be bad and lead to this kind of error here? OK, so what if I had a 0 there and then 1 and 1? It doesn't matter what the other ones are. Right? What's, what do I have here now? Negative b plus minus blah, blah, blah. What's in the denominator? 2a, which is going to be 0. If you divide by 0, what do you get? Negative inf. Right? What's inf? Why is it negative? Right? That, is that a real number? I don't know. The other one's still a nan. Right? So I've, I've got some inputs here that could potentially give me some errors. There's actually one other uh, condition that could give us another error. Who's responsible for handling this stuff? That's the topic this week, error handling. right? So programs, programs may have uh, potential for errors, right? Uh, some can be unexpected. Others can be anticipated. And maybe handled. Others are simply fatal, right? An example of a fatal error is, say we've got a more sophisticated program that needs to connect to the internet because, well, it's, it's like a web browser, right? If you have no, uh, no internet connection and it tries to uh, connect to a remote server to connect to a database or something like that, you can't write a program to troubleshoot your network connectivity, right? Uh, there's just no way that you can do that. So in th those kinds of situations, the errors are probably fatal. You want your program to simply just die and, uh, stop, uh, and, and, and terminate before, because uh, it, it, it can't recover from something like that. Other things you might be able to recover from, right? Uh, there are some errors that can be anticipated, and oh, okay, well, if server A is not uh, available, maybe then we'll go to the backup server instead, right? Uh, may, uh, may, maybe that's one way that you can recover. Uh, and so you can anticipate some of these errors. Others can be completely unexpected. Somebody comes up to the computer and kicks out the power cord. Right? There's no way that you can write software or even uh, to, uh, to, to recover from something like that. That would require some sort of a hardware solution, which is a, an automatic switch to a backup or something. Right? Uh, and so in, as far as software is concerned, you have these kind of uh, classes of errors. Some of them you can handle. Uh, some of them you can't. And others, you, there's no way. No matter, you, you can't even anticipate them. Right? So what we're going to do is we're going to follow one general strategy. In C, our general strategy will be defensive programming. All right? So um, in basically, we'll anticipate errors and look before we leap. Right? As an example, suppose that you're about to divide by 0. If, you're, uh, if, you, if you have A divided by B, what do you do to prevent you from dividing by 0? You look at B. Right? You look at the denominator. Is it equal to 0? You look before you leap. If it is equal to 0, you don't divide by it. Right? You do something else. This involves a conditional check. And you've actually been doing this up to this point if you're checking for the number of command line arguments in certain programs. If, they, if you expect five command line arguments, and they only give you four or six or something like that, you can just echo an error message and then quit on them. Right? So you've been doing a little bit of defensive programming up to this point. Uh, and you, look, uh, you certainly don't leap before you look. You check these things, and if, it, uh, and if it's unsafe, you don't do it. If, if, if after you check it, oh, OK, well, it's safe to proceed, then, then you go ahead and do that stuff. All right? uh, uh, and in, uh, in general, 
in general, output values uh, will uh, be uh, done via uh, the, the pass by reference uh, variables. Right? This leaves a function's return value uh, open to, uh, to be used for what are called error codes. Right? Error codes tell the user or tell the, the program, other pieces of the program, what potentially happened. For example, in our quadratic roots here, uh, if you gave it A, B, and C such that A was 0 and so it was about to divide by 0, it'll be defensive programming. It won't divide by 0. Instead, it'll stop the execution and simply report back to the calling function, hey, this kind of error occurred. Uh, you decide how to handle this now. Right? Uh, or if, it, if, if, if it's a different type of error where you've got uh, A, B, and C such that it would lead to uh, complex roots. It'll say, it'll, well, I'm not going to do that because I don't know how you want me to handle that. So I'm going to report back to the calling function what happened. Right? Then the calling function, then the responsibility for how to handle, that is, handle the error, will, reside, uh, will fall to the calling function. And the reason that we do this is for design flexibility. What, hap what would happen if you called square root on negative 1? We've seen it before. You get not a number, right? Does it crash the entire program? No. Uh, because if it did, what would happen? Right? You, you, the, the, you, uh, you're, you're a user. You're a consumer of the math library. If the math library started making design decisions for you that any time you call negative uh, square root on a negative one, I'm going to quit out of your program with this error message over here. That would not be a very usable library because it's making the decision for us rather than just reporting back to us what happened so that we can make the decision on how to proceed. Maybe we want to prompt the user again for valid input. Maybe we want to give them a different error message that you shouldn't have done this because this program doesn't support that, and then we'll quit on them. Or maybe we'll use instead some default value, some sensible default value, not necessarily in that, uh, that program, but maybe in other programs it would be sensible to, have, to, to then default back to some value. Right? So th the reason that we only report, that, uh, that we o in our design, uh, error handling design, we only report the errors is so that the calling function can decide what to do. If we, uh, if, we if we decided, if, uh, in our function, say, to quit out of the entire program, that would take the decision-making process away from the people that, that it belongs to, the, de the designers, the users, the, uh, the programmers, right? Uh, we, don't wa we want that, them to have that responsibility, so we'll simply report it, OK? All right. Uh, let's see. So now that we understand the, uh, the, the context here, let's look at uh, how, uh, how C does system level error handling. Right? The, not necessarily that you would use this directly, but it's going to inspire us to understand how to use error handling ourselves. Uh, the, uh, the, pot, uh, the POSIX standard uh, actually only defines three error codes. Right? And those are, and I'm going to go ahead, uh, I'll, I'll, I'll use this, here we go, uh, EDOM. There we go. Uh, e range and E I L S E Q. I've got to, oh, I've got to spell that uh, spell that out in my head every single time, right? So what is POSIX? Well, POSIX just stands for Portable Operating System Interfa uh, Interface, and then the X I think Exchange or something like that, or are they just threw an X on it to make it sound better? Uh, what it is is it's a, uh, it's a uh, it's a standard that any, any POSIX-compliant operating system will have this minimum level of operations. So that when you write a C program, or you write any program for that matter, and then you make system calls, certain amount of things are guaranteed to be there. For example, these three things are guaranteed to be any, any POSIX-compliant system. My Mac here is based on, uh, it, it's a Mac operating system, but it's based on a BSD Linux variant. That's POSIX-compliant. If you've got a Linux operating system out there, I've never seen a Linux that's not uh, POSIX compliant. They're all POSIX compliant. Unix is cos POSIX compliant. The only operating system that's not POSIX compliant is the other one that I didn't mention, Windows. 
uh, because Microsoft decided that they don't need to play fair with everybody and uh, uh, be cr uh, cross compatible with anything. So the only, the only one that you have to really worry about is Windows programming. And even then, they're turning the ship around and, and starting to uh, uh, you know, uh, apply standards to their stuff. So who knows, maybe we'll have a POSIX compliant Windows 11. If, what are they on right now? 10? OK, so maybe 11. Who knows? I don't know. Uh, but POSIX is a standard that, it, uh, that guarantees a minimum level of uh, interface, the stuff that's guaranteed to be there. Uh, the three things with, uh, with respect to error codes are these three things. EDOM indicates an error in the domain of a function. That's what DOM stands for, of a function. ERANGE indicates an error in the range of a function. So what are dom domain and range? So remember back to, I don't know, high school mathematics or whatever it is, right? Here you've got a basic function, a sine x or whatever, right? What is your domain and what is your range? What's the domain? X values. This is your domain. In other words, your inputs. So if there's an EDOM error, that indicates an error in the input. You gave me some bad input, so it raises this uh, error code. What's our range? If I've got x squared, what does it look like? It's a parabola concave up at the origin. What's its range? Y values. In this case, the Y values, do they go down here to the negatives? Nope. So it's the range of this function is actually Y greater than or equal to 0. Right? This is the range. In other words, the range is the outputs. Right? Or output, I should say. Remember, you can't have outputs right? uh, with a function. So uh, indicating an error in the range means that there would be an erroneous output uh, when you called this function. Here are two classic examples that are easy to understand. Square root of negative 1, which we've talked about here. That's going to be an error in the input. You can't take the square root of a negative 1 unless you're talking about complex domains. And this is not a complex domain, so there's an error in the domain of this function, in the inputs. Uh, and a classic example for an E range error would be a log of 0. Log, uh, that's the natural log. So what is the log of 0? What, what, what does the natural log look like? If you, if you graphed it, here's the graph. So obviously, it's monotone increasing this way. But what happens at E? What's this value? 1, right? Then what happens, uh, so it, then it grows from there. What happens between 0 and 1? So here's the, x, uh, here's the y axis. What happens between 0 and 1? It goes back down all the way to? infinity. In other words, negative inf. That's an error in the range, because negative inf is outside the range of every, anything that C can express. So that's an error in the range. EIS, uh, you'll never actually see this unless you do systems level programming. This is an illegal byte sequence. Right? So the way that this works is these and many more errors are defined in a header file named errorno.h. Errorno is short for error number, right? That's error number, <laughs> number, number, right? A uh, common uh, the abbreviation of number is NO, right? Uh, and so uh, basically what happens uh, in, in the event of an error, a global error code value called, I believe it's errorno, is set to one of the uh, three or more errors in the system. Right. And then you can check this. Did an error E range uh, occur? Did an E DOM occur? Did an illegal byte sequence occur? Or did some other error occur? A POSIX, only uh, POSIX compliance systems only require these three, but I will show you uh, what all the others look like. I'll just go ahead and search for errorno.h, right, the source code, and we'll go ahead, this will go ahead and bring it up here. I'll go ahead and zoom in. So in uh, most U Unix systems, over 130, 
one error states are actually defined. Uh, let's search for those three that are guaranteed. EDOM, there it is. It's guaranteed to be there. It has a value of 33, right? What is this called again? Define, and then something, and then you give it a, an alias. This is called a macro, remember? And so basically, I, I can use EDOM in my program uh, to check for it, to uh, check a quality, to do whatever I want with it. But when it gets compiled, the value that it actually gets is 33. Right? What about E range? It lives right next to it, has a value of 34. What about E I L S E Q? Well, that's over at 84. Right? So do you, do you think it's a good idea for me to require you to remember that one is 33, and the other one is 34, and the other one is 84? Do you want to remember that stuff? No. That's why we define these things. We usually call those magic numbers. If you're using these, uh, not random numbers, but if you're using this, these mysterious numbers to represent something, then you quickly forget which number represented what thing. So instead, in your program, you use these more human readable terms, right? Arguably, they're not human readable, but at least you can read e users. There are too many users, right? You can read, uh, I don't know, what's uh, uh, no, no buffer space. E, no buffs, right? Uh, no buffer space, or uh, memory, uh, there is an E, no memory, out of memory error, right? Uh, and so, uh, il or an il permission denied, E access error. So the, the, these representations actually give you some human readable context to remember what these errors mean, rather than just these mysterious and magic numbers over here. So this is telling me that there are two design principles that we want to follow. We don't want to have magic numbers, but we do want to have Human, uh, we do want to have, uh, communicate different types of errors in different types of situations. So we're going to take those two design principles and we're going to uh, uh, design error handling for our quadratic roots program here in a second. Before we do that, I want to look at, uh, where am I? Where am I? Okay. Uh, let me go into a, another demonstration here. Um, let's go see one, two, five, e. Programs, error handling. Okay. Here's an error demo. This is directly from the book. So uh, if you want to, you can check out the book here. I'm going to show you, uh, I'm, I'm just showing you uh, again how uh, those POSIX compliant error codes work. I've got uh, A, B, and C here, negative 1, 2, and 0, and then X. This is perfectly fine. We're going to print out the result, that is the square root of 2, which is 1.41 something, something, something. And then we're also going to print out that error no. There's no error here. So what do you think, val what value should it print out, do you think, if there's no error? Was there an error? No, it's false. There was no error. Zero, right? That convention is coming back again. Zero represents no error, just as zero represents false. Anything else represents, yes, there was an error. One through 131. Yes, there was an error. It was one of these 132 uh, different uh, types of errors, right? So we're pro going to expect zero there. NAN and an EDOM error. I'm going to try to call square root on A, which is negative one. Again, we would expect an EDOM error. I'm going to print this out and see if we get the same value as reported, uh, as reported uh, in that source code that we just looked at. Uh, and then I'm going to, uh, then I, uh, you can even make comparisons. Was the error number, was it an E DOM, or was it an E range, or was it an E uh, illegal byte sequence? Right. Then uh, you, can even, uh, you can even print out a standard error message, a human readable error message for this. It's not going to be that valuable, but I'm showing you how to do it. And then finally, I take the log of zero, which is going to be an E range error. Right. And so this, uh, this equality will end up being true, and it'll print out that it was an E range error. Uh, and I'm not able to intentionally re repeat a, uh, an illegal byte sequence. That would take some, some doing. Uh, so I, did, I, I have not shown that one. So let's just go ahead and compile this. Error demo. There we go. Oh, and I'm using the math library, so hyphen lm on CSE. Let's go ahead and run this. Let me go ahead and run it again, but clean. There, error of zero. Right? Uh, when we tried to call negative 1 on square root, we got an, uh, an EDOM error, and it had a value of 33. Does that match up with what we had before? Find EDOM. Yep, there's its value, 33. Then later on in the program, we called a log of 0, 
and that resulted in an error of th an E range error, which has a value of 34, which again matches this source code over here. And the, uh, the, the again, the met uh, I printed out the human readable messages, but they're not that helpful. A numerical argument out of domain, <laughs> numerical argument out of range, right? But you could expect that, uh, that if you're doing systems level programming, these 100 or so uh, different error codes would be absolutely necessary for you to, uh, to, do, uh, to do error handling at a system level, right? We're not going to be doing system level programming. Instead, we're going to design our own error handling, right? So to do that, though, I want to look at enumerated types first. So many pieces of data uh, have a fixed, have a fixed, and limited number of possible uh, um, number of possible values. Right? For example, days of the week: Sunday or Monday? Which? Where do we start our week? Sunday. All right, most people started on Sunday. Some people started on Monday. Uh, I started on Sunday, even though, again, we call it the weekend, even though half the weekend is at the week beginning. So one of those two things is wrong. Uh, but uh, we'll go ahead and start our, our, our day of the week on Sunday. Uh, and then Sunday, Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday, we've got seven days of the week, right? And they're not adding any more anytime soon. So we've got a, an example where we've got a fixed number of values, right? Uh, you can also have months or what we're considering right now, error codes. Right? So in C, you, you can define an enumerated type and give predefined human-readable values to these lists. Right? That's why we call them enumerated types. What does enumeration mean? Enumeration simply means enumerate everything, list everything out. A bullet pointed list is an enumeration. Here's one thing, here's the second thing, here's the third thing. It's an exhaustive list, and there might be, you might uh, consider some order to it, maybe not, it doesn't matter. It's just a list, it's an enumeration, right? Uh, for example, uh, suppose that I, uh, it, I didn't have enumerated types. How would I represent the days of the week? Uh, I could represent uh, Sunday as one, and then what would, what would I represent Monday as? Two, three, and then three, four, five, six, seven, right? That's assuming that you started your week on Sunday. What if somebody comes in with different assumptions? They assume, oh, well, we start our week on Monday. And they are under the assumption that one is Monday rather than Sunday. Right? They've got different set of assumptions. And because it's just a bunch of mysterious numbers, one, two, three, four, five, may maybe some other person said, no, I agree, we start on Sunday, but I'll start my numbering at zero instead. Or for some odd reason, I'll go by tens, 10, 20, 30, 40, right? There are just too many different ways of expressing that numerically. And so what I want to do is I want to eliminate those numbers, right? Uh, if, if you represented these lists with lists, with numbers, they become what are called magic numbers, right? No one, uh, without, without context, no one, or at least, or at least not everyone, will understand what they mean. Sometimes you want magic numbers because you want to obfuscate things or you just want, uh, in cryptography, they use magic numbers all the time. Magic numbers, they're, they're these numbers that we chose so that there's, they, they call them nothing up our sleeves numbers. Uh, they're publicly available numbers that anybody can check and verify uh, and that, uh, that nobody can uh, say, well, wait, you chose those numbers for a reason, probably because it gives you a backdoor to this crypto system or whatever, right? Nope, nope, nothing up my sleeve. These are the num published numbers. Find, uh, find an error with that, right? And so in some applications, you do want magic numbers. But for code readability, understandability, and maintainability, you do not want magic numbers. You don't want these mysterious numbers that, uh, what was 5, 4 again? Uh, in fact, what was an EDOM error? Was it 33 or 32, right? I take it to a different system that used different numbers, a different ordering, and all my assumptions go out the window, even though it's still POSIX compliant, right? So instead, you can define an enumerated list. And here, I'm going to do that now. Let's do it for the day of the week. 
Here's the syntax. Type def enum, opening curly bracket, closing curly bracket. So before we go on, let's understand what that means. Type def. What do you think that that stands for? Type definition, right? I'm defining a new type. What are types? You've been using types. Integers, int, double, char. All of these are types of variables that are built into the programming language. Now we're going to extend that programming language and add new types. We're adding new vocabulary to the language. Right? What type of uh, value are uh, what type are we uh, uh, creating here? We're creating an enum. Enum is short for an enumeration or an enumerated type. Now inside the uh, opening and closing curly brackets, that's where you provide the list. So we'll go ahead and start our week on Sunday, Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday, Friday, and Saturday. And just so that it's all uh, not uh, boring code stuff, uh, what are the days of the ne week named for? Sunday, Monday, they're pretty obvious for the sun and the moon. What is Tuesday named for? Uh, no, no, uh, hold that one. Tuesday is Tyre, uh, who is a Roman god of, uh, I forget what, but uh, like the, the, the FTD guy, right? The guy that was fast or something. Uh, Wednesday, Odin's Day, exactly. It was the, the Norse god of, well, the Norse all-father, the uh, uh, Odin, right? Thursday, that's where Thor is. Thor, uh, Thursday is Thor's day. Uh, what about Friday? Freya, right? Uh, Odin's wife, I believe, right? I'm not sure, though. All right, so that's Freya's day. And then finally, Saturn. It's what? For the boy. <laughs> I don't know about that. Uh, but Saturday, uh, oh, oh, did I spell it right? Saturday, yeah, OK. Saturday is for Saturn's day. Saturn is one of the, he's not a god. He's a, uh, he's a titan, right? He gave birth to the gods, and then uh, Zeus came and, and yeah, freed them all by cutting open his belly and killing him, right? So nice, nice, Greek, uh, nice, uh, nice mix of Greek, Roman, uh, and Norse mythology here. Yeah. That, 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 that's going to be a style thing, and we'll talk about that in a moment, but yeah. All right? uh, and the last part of the syntax is that I need to give this type a name. Integers have a name, int. Doubles have a name, double. Characters have a name, char. I need to give my type a name. And for that, it's just going to be simply a day of week. Right? And note the semicolon there. I have to end it with a semicolon. Right? So syntax and style notes. Oops, in tax and style notes. There we go. So uh, you use type def enum to uh, and opening and closing curly brackets. Then inside, you provide a comma delimited list. Right? Those are commas. They need to be commas right? of values, of human readable values. You end it with the name of the enumerated type. And here, for style, you're going to want to use probably the modern style of upper camel casing. Right? For values, use uh, upper underscore casing. So all of my examples, there was just single words. So it was all just uppercase. If you had multiple words, you would be all uppercase. And then to separate the words to make it more readable, you would use underscores. You'll notice that the, uh, the Arano library didn't do that. E and then uh, whatever, they didn't separate everything. We're going to go a, a different way, because we don't want to emulate the system level error handling, because we're not doing system level error handling. We're doing user land uh, you know, library error, uh, error handling. Um, generally, white space does not matter, but usually the list is one per line right? uh, and indented. Right? The, again, that's just style. And it's because it makes it more readable. Imagine if I took those seven things and put them all on one line. It would be very difficult to determine uh, you know, the order. It would, it, it would be less readable. Uh, this is why in, in a lot of writing, you take 
uh, a long list and then you put it into a bullet pointed list so that you can actually read these things. Uh, maybe there might be some ordering to it as well, but that, that, that generally doesn't matter. And that last comma, strictly speaking, is not absolutely necessary. Uh, just like if you had a list in plain old English, um, A, comma, B, comma, and uh, C, right? Even that comma, it's the Oxford comma, is, is what, uh, that last comma before the and, it's optional, or I forget what the modern style is to not do it. Anybody? I don't know. It's the Oxford comma. Look it up. Uh, but in this case, we've got yet an, uh, an extraneous comma at the end. Take it or leave it, but all the other commas are absolutely necessary. Generally, it's advised to put a comma at the very end, uh, because if you ever want to come back and add to your list and then you forget that last comma, uh, then, it'll, then it's going to be a, a problem. But this is a nice, tight definition for day of week. It also provides some ordering. Right? Uh, enumerated types have a built-in representation of integers, which, uh, by default, start at 0. Right? So in this case, Sunday would have a value of, it's the first one, so if it starts by default at 0, it'll have a value of 0. Monday will be 1. Tuesday will be 2. What will, what will Saturday be? Careful. You start at 0. The seventh one is 6. All right? So because of this internal representation, you can get into trouble. All right? So pitfall or pitfall. Because they are represented as integers, there is no type safety check for bad code. For example. Let me go ahead and uh, go into code mode here. And let me go ahead and, cr uh, and use this type now. Day of week. Today. Right. Now, what is today? Monday. I forgot already. Did we start on a Monday? Did, did we, uh, so is Monday 0? Is Monday 1? Uh, maybe we started our list not defaulting at 0. Maybe, maybe we started it at uh, 1 instead. So maybe it's a 2. Do I have to worry about that anymore? Nope. Now I can type Monday, right? rather than replying on those mysterious magic numbers. I can directly use those values in my code. I can print it out right? uh, today. I can set, reset it, right? or uh, day of week. Tomorrow is equal to Tuesday. Right? But I can also do bad things. Day of week, uh, someday is equal to, uh, let's get, what, what's the last day of the week according to our thing? Saturday, right? And plus one. What value is that? Sa what's the day after Saturday? Should be Sunday, right? But remember, these things are represented by integers. We already said Saturday had a, an internal representation of six. So if I add one to six, I don't get Sunday. I get seven. Is seven any of those days? Nope, that's outside the list. Just as if I had said someday, uh, someday is equal to one, two, three, four, five. Right? Is there any day 12,345? Yeah. No. <laughs> In some sense, there is, right? But not the day of the week, right? So this can get you into trouble if you don't understand how it's actually uh, internally represented. Uh, if you want it to roll over back to Sunday, so you get to Saturday, and you want it to roll back over to Sunday, by adding some days, you need to mod out by 7. And that'll work. Uh, but that's, that's requiring you to mix um, numerical operations with uh, enumerated types. And that's not what enumerated types are supposed to do. Enumerated types are simply supposed to relieve you of the need of remembering all those magic numbers. Okay? So don't do something like this. Don't do arithmetic with enumerated types. Okay? Don't abuse. Don't abuse enumerated types. The, uh, the, the main purpose is to relieve, uh, relieve you of uh, having to remember a bunch of magic numbers. All right. So let's go ahead and do a demonstration here. 
Uh, let's use enumerated types to define error uh, to uh, to perform error handling in our quadratic program programming uh, 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 pro quadratic roots program, I should say. Quadratic programming is an optimization technique. Don't worry about it. That's uh, something completely different right? and not related to this thing at all. all right. uh, let me exit out of this. And oops, Emacs. All right. So I want to, in compute roots here, I want to do some error handling. Now, because I am uh, I'm returning the output values as using uh, pass by reference, that leaves the return value here wide open. I can now use that for whatever I want. Right? Initially, let me go ahead and change it to an integer. That's going to represent an error code. Okay, it's going to represent well. There was a division. There would have been a division by zero error, or there would have been a complex root error. Or maybe there's some other type of error that we want to capture here. All right. Let me go ahead and go down and check this out. Where does error handling belong here? If I'm going to do defensive programming and I'm going to do, look before I leap, where should I do it? Should I do it before or should I do it after? Should I do it after? If A is 0, then I'm going to have division by 0 error, right? Let's return something. I'll come back to that. Uh, because there would be a division by division by 0. Right. Is that right? What have I done here? I've leapt before I looked. Right? I did the division by 0 up on that line right there. Oops, come on. There. All right, it's just being slow. Come on. On these two lines, I divided by 0. And then I checked, oh, am I about to divide by 0? I already did. Right? You look before you leap. You do error handling, error checking, before you do that dangerous operation. So let me go ahead and do that here. If A is 0, then there would be a division by, a division by 0. Right? So instead of doing that, I'm going to return some value. Okay. What's another error condition? What was the other type of error that we already uh, identified? Complex root, right? So complex root error, right? And what, what, what condition do I need to check there? If that thing is negative, then we would end up giving a negative value to the square root function, ending up with an EDOM error. And we don't want to do that. What's an EDOM error? What's NAN? Right? We want to handle these things differently. We want to explicitly state that our program does not support complex roots. Right? You decide how to handle that now. The calling function does. All right? All right, so if that thing, copy, paste, is less than, oops, not less than 0, then there's going to be a complex root error. Return question mark, question mark, else if, we'll come back to this last error. Otherwise, if there's no error, then yeah, go ahead. You've looked, go, and everything's safe, so go ahead and leap, OK? And return something there. I don't know yet. Right. Let's go ahead and take it from the top here. What should I return if there's a division by 0 error? I'm just going to. I'm just going to return 1 for now. We'll come back to it. What should I return? Should I also return 1? Probably not. I could, but what does that design decision do? It says there was an error. It doesn't say there was this type of error or there was this type of error. It's error. I don't know. You, you take care of it. I'm, I'm not going to tell you anything else. That seems really inflexible, right? So at least, let's at least distinguish between those two types of errors. Okay? If there's a third type of error, maybe we'll return 3. And then again, we'll come back to this here in a second. If there's no error, what should I return? 0. Because 0 indicates false. Anything else indicates true. Was there an error? No, there wasn't. 0. 
Was there an error? Yes, there was. There was this type of error, or this type of error, or this type of error, or this type of error. So I'm going to use 0 there. Okay. Now, what's the other thing that could go wrong here? You haven't had much practice with pointers yet, but this has two pass by reference values. Some pointers can be bad. Right? Uh, pointers can point to something that doesn't belong to you, and you, in which case you get a segmentation fault. Uh, and you're not going to really be able to protect yourself against those things. But there's at least one type of pointer that you can check for that you sh probably shouldn't be screwing around with. What's that special value that we use with pointers? I think I heard it. What? Null, right? What if root 1 was null? If root 1 is null, or if root 2 is null, what would happen if I tried to dereference it? It doesn't point to a bucket that I can put something in. It points to null. It points to nothing. What happens when there's nothing and you try to put something into that nothing bucket? Falls, right? In which case, you've got a null pointer, uh, uh, the null pointer error, uh, and it's going to end up with a segmentation fault. Right? And if there's time at the end, I'll, sh I'll give you a reminder about that. Right? It's going to be really, yeah, after I show you, uh, show you this, it'll, it'll be really easy to remember that. Do not dereference null pointers. Uh, it means that you're trying to, to uh, change. Uh, remember, dereferencing takes a regular old or a pointer variable and changes it into a regular variable. If it's null, it's not a pointer at all, and you're trying to change, change nothing into something. It's not going to work. Okay. So again, this is a null pointer error. Okay. That looks good as far as error handling goes. Let's go back up to our main here and see how we can now take advantage of this. I'm going to capture the return value as an error code. And now I get to decide what to do with it. If error code is 1, that was a division by 0 error, I think. Right? And so I'll print f. Uh, you have a linear function here, not a quadratic. Right? Because if this is 0 right here, what happens to this? Goes away. You've got a linear function there. How do you solve for that? How do you solve for x now? Minus c divided by b, and you're good to go. Right? So maybe you could uh, write that code here instead. Right? Uh, I'll, just, I'll just simply go ahead and exit on them with an error code. Again, these are error codes. Else if error code is equal to 2, oops, equal to 2, then I'll give them a different error message. This program does not support complex roots. And exit on them. Maybe you could put, get, provide a different exit code. Else if error code is equal to 3, wow, something really went wrong. Oh, uh, wow, uh, that really screwed up. Because uh, we're not going to be able to do that intentionally. Uh, we're we're going to have to do it intentionally to get this error code. Else, OK, well, no error. So let's go ahead and print those roots for them. Let's see how much of an improvement this is from a u end user. Uh, we call that UX, user experience, a UX point of view. So GCC, oops. Uh, oh, I changed it to int there. And I should have changed it to int here, sorry. Otherwise, I think that that's it. Yep, there we go. All right, so now give me, so, uh, what were those errors? Uh, where you've got a, sm uh, a small b, right? This would be a complex root exception. Oh, now instead of getting those mysterious random numbers of int nan, I'm actually getting a human readable message now. Right? What's another one? Zero, one. One, that'll be a linear function. And maybe, we could, maybe instead of just giving them an error message, we could have still solved it for them. You probably meant to solve a linear function. By the way, here's the solution. Negative, B divided, or negative C divided by B. And then, of course, then you'd have to check that B is not 0. Otherwise, you'd be dividing by 0 there. Right? Uh, and I'm not going to be able to reproduce uh, the, the null pointer error here uh, without forcing it to give it a null. Recompile it. I'm even getting a warning here. And then uh, 
some valid value here, 1, 10, 1. Right? Wow, that really screwed up. Right? And that's because I shouldn't have done that, definitely. Right? But it's entirely possible, and you do need to make null pointer checks. OK? All right. Say again. Uh, oh, thank you. Two. There we go. All right. And make sure that still works. Yep. And of course, let's try. Uh, you need to do what's called reg regression testing. You need to go back and all for all those values. I, I made changes to the code, right? Did I regress back to a, a, an even worse program? In other words, did I introduce new bugs by making those improvements, by making those changes? So let's go back and make sure that uh, I didn't uh, screw it up. Uh, one ten or yeah, one ten one. That'll be good, right? And so there's that point, well, negative point 0.1 and negative uh, uh, 9.89. Right? I didn't break anything by doing this. But it's not really readable. Right? Error code 1, 2, 3. We just did this exercise, so it's fresh in our minds. And there are only three of them, so it's easy to remember. Come back two weeks from now, a month from now, years from now. Are you going to remember the order of those things? No. Uh, introduce more, er po uh, more possible errors. Suppose that you've got a more complex library that you're writing. Now you've got 50, or like POSIX, 131 different types of errors. Are you going to remember those? No way in hell. Right? So what we're going to do is we're going to change it so that it's using enumerated types. How do I do that again? Type def, enum, opening bracket, closing curly bracket. I'll, I, I could call it error, but I'm polluting the namespace. If I call my uh, uh, enumerated type error, that might conflict with somebody else's enumerated type called error because error is a common name. Maybe I want to make it specific to quadratic roots error, or maybe just quadratic error, or whatever. Right? Probably want to make it so that it's my name, so that it's, it, it applies to what I'm doing. What's the first type of error? A division by zero error. Right. Remember, all upper, uppercase underscore casing. What was the other one? What was another one? Complex root error. Right. Last one was null pointer, 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 pointer error. Right. What about the event that there's no error? I probably want to include that in my list, right? Where should I include it if I wanted to have the value of 0? At the very first one. No error. Right. Now, by default, these will take on the values 0, 1, 2, and 3, just matching what I did down here. Now I can take and eliminate these magic numbers. Uh, this was going to be division by 0 error. This one was complex root error. And this one was null pointer error. Right. Now, come back two weeks, a month, several years later, and you don't have to remember what those were. Right. You might want to look up the documentation of what they, what they all meant, maybe, if you don't, uh, don't remember the quadratic equation. But at least you don't have to have any guesswork here. Right. Likewise, you'll want to change your own function. Instead of returning 0, return division by, well, by 0 error. Right. Return complex root error. And null pointer error. And finally, make sure that you do the 0, no error. Right. And you'll want to change the return type. It's still an int, but let's be more explicit about it. What type is it really? Let's go all the way up here. It's a quadratic error. Right? So instead of capturing an integer error code, we can capture a quadratic error. Instead of returning, I'll have to change that up top too. Instead of returning an int, we'll return a quadratic error. Oops. And I need to change this one too. Right? And now all the types match. Compiler is happy. It's more readable code. More readable code is more maintainable code. More maintainable code is more 
uh, stable code, bug, uh, le less likely to break, less likely to have uh, problems and errors. Okay. All right. Any questions so far on this? Yeah. There is no try catch in, in C. Uh, that's a modern construct, which I'm not going to cover because we're only doing C. Another way, of, a more modern way of doing error checking is using a try catch, uh, using what are called exceptions. Uh, exceptions are something that are raised by a program or raised by an operating system uh, under an error condition. Uh, you can, exp in your program, in say Java, you can explicitly throw an exception. Uh, for example, uh, you can throw a new exception that is a uh, complex root exception or something like that. And then remember the call stack. Function calls function calls function calls function. Up here at this, the current function, if an exception happens, it gets thrown. It gets thrown downwards. Do you want to handle it? Yes or no? They can catch it if they do. If not, they can ignore it, in which case it go, then goes it's thrown down to the next function down to the next function, down to the next function. If somebody catches it, then the, uh, the cascading error stops, and whatever code you've got to, to handle that exception, compute a, a linear function instead, or reprompt them for input, or do something else entirely, right? Then you can handle that exception. And because it's thrown, the way, the way that you do this is through what's called a catch, right? So you've got these, this throw statement, you've got this catch statement. Uh, and uh, uh, surrounded by a tr try this dangerous code, and if it throws an exception, you can catch it down here and handle it however you want to handle it. That's a more modern uh, convention of uh, error handling, uh, approach to error handling. That's in Java, C Sharp, C++ has uh, exceptions. It's not a cure-all. Uh, even Java got it wrong in some, se uh, in, in some sense. They've got a difference between catched exceptions, uh, checked exceptions and unchecked exceptions, which is a design flaw from the beginning. Uh, and you know, we, we, when, you, when you learn Java, you'll see why. Uh, but that's another approach to error handling. It's try catch, which also goes nicely with, um, with the way that I, I cover it. It's defensive programming. You look before you leap, right? You're coming up to the edge of a cliff. You look, oh, I would, if I left, I would fall. Well, in a programming language like Java that has exceptions, it's OK to go ahead and leap. Go ahead and leap, because it'll catch the exception and then bring you back up and let you decide what do you want to do. Right? Uh, so it's a little bit different design approach to error handling, uh, but it is something in a lot of other modern programming languages. C does not have exceptions. Right? It's just defensive programming, communicating error codes, looking before you leap, and then deciding not to jump over that cliff. And then communicating, no, no, if you actually wanted me to do that, then you're going to have to do it yourself because I'm not going to jump over the cliff for you. Right? All right, good. Any other questions so far? No? OK. Well, that's error handling in a nutshell for uh, your uh, 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 lab tomorrow, uh, in which you'll, uh, you'll write a program. Uh, it's just bas a very basic flower shop program. Uh, where you, you c calculate how much it costs to do a bouquet of flowers with some add-ons or whatever. Uh, and then uh, you change it so that instead of all of these different functions, you're only calling one function by using pass by reference. Then you add in some error checking because maybe some, some configurations of flowers like roses with a, a white vase, or, uh, they're, they're out of roses or something like that. And so you need to ha do that error handling. Uh, and so you'll introduce some error handling enumerated types, and then at the end of the day, you'll make it all modular. Remember modularity that you take related functions and enumerated types, and you separate them out into the prototypes and enumerated types and documentation over here in the header file. And then over in your source file is all of your implementations. And that way, you can separate things out into different separate files, uh, or organizing your code a lot better. Okay? I think we also give you a make file for it so you don't have to do it from scratch. Uh, if not, and if not, then you want to start learning make files. Then I think that we've got an advanced activity in that one for you to do. Uh, otherwise, I, I did promise you to, that uh, I would show you. Always remember Bret Hart's advice. Uh, all right. For, first of all, who, who's Bret Hart? Nobody knows who Bret Hart is. Think '80s wrestling. Nobody knows '80s wrestling. Everybody knows Hulk Hogan. Everybody knows Macho Man Randy Savage. 
Nobody remembers the Canadian wrestler Bret Hart. I was thinking of Baby Bret. What? Oh, baby Brett, no. No, Bret Hart was a wrestler in the 80s. Uh, he died tragically in the ring. Uh, he fell, uh, they were doing a stunt, and he fell 30 feet and broke his neck. So he has passed away. But in the, very, uh, in the 90s, he was still a, a, a big wrestler. Uh, and there he is right there. So the Brett, the hitman Hart. Does that ring your bell now? No? All right. Well, oh, what? What? Is Bret Hart <laughs> alive? Uh, no, he is dead. Hart died. Oh, his br oh, Owen Hart died. Really? Oh, okay. I've been wrong the entire time. He is 61, and he's still like, oh, okay, darn it. All right. No, no, not darn it that he's, uh, he's dead. But here's Bret Hart's advice. So he's, he's not dead. Owen Hart, his brother, is, uh, is, uh, is dead. But he is definitely Come retired. On, you guys. Okay. All right, so the, 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 the audio is playing here. In the mid, uh, earlier mid-90s, they, of course, wrestling games are still a thing, I imagine. Uh, they, they put out a promotional video about uh, whatever, whatever uh, wrestling game they, uh, they, were, they were building at the time, making at the time. And uh, within it, uh, they, they have the program. Uh, this, it's this promotional video with the programmers, of course. You see them there. And the wrestlers. And then uh, they made it. The, the, the premise was that the wrestlers were helping them to develop this video game. And so here's a nice little scene. Of course, it's written in C or C++, whichever one. Uh, and here's Bret Hart giving advice about no pointers. Come on, you guys. There it is right there in front of you the whole time. You're dereferencing a no pointer. Open your eyes. So, <laughs> if anybody dereferences a null pointer and doesn't understand what they're, what they're doing, you're going to get a slap to the back of the head, maybe. Right? So don't dereference null pointers. No, I won't hit you in the back of the head. But remember Bret Hart's advice. Don't dereference null pointers. Always do a null pointer check in your error handling. All right? <laughs>